Guys, welcome back to Wildebeard Reviews and welcome back to the Rewind Review Series here on the channel. I know it's been a minute. Thank you guys for your patience as I did the homework I needed to do to prepare for this new series. That's right, we are finally talking about Mutant Massacre. Now, what is Mutant Massacre? It is a 12-issue story arc crossover from late 1986 into early 1987 from Marvel Comics. It covers four issues of Uncanny X-Men, three issues of X-Factor, two issues of Thor, and one each issue of Daredevil, New Mutants, and Power Pack. And it tells the story of Mr. Sinister's Marauders massacring the Morlocks in the tunnels under Manhattan and how the uh, teams of the Uncanny X-Men and X-Factor and a few other characters deal with and handle that massacre. And it is a fantastic series that I am glad I've read and we are going to spend a few videos talking about. Now, typically on a Rewind Review, as I do most of the things that I review here on the channel, I go page by page and um, go through the comic and commentate on basically every page and give um, knowledge tidbits, my impressions on everything as we go. We're going to take this one a little bit differently. So I have gone ahead and read through all 12 of these issues and done something I don't normally do with reviews I took notes. I took a lot of notes. I took about a, at least a half a page to a full page, if not more, notes on each and every one of these issues as I was reading through them. Stuff I needed to look up, characters I didn't know, all that kind of stuff, so I could bring you the best kind of stuff, the best review that I could possibly do as I stumble over my own words. There, I'm not going to edit that out. <laughs> so what we're going to do is break this up into chunks. Something that I noticed as I was going through it is there's a few different kind of stages within this story. The first two issues that we're going to go over today are uh, Uncanny X-Men issue 210 and X-Factor 9. Both of these issues kind of serve as a prelude or intro or setup to Mutant Massacre. and they, They're actually a little bit light on story for the actual Mutant Massacre. Again, it's just kind of a prelude, so we're going to touch on those um, prelude pieces um, and then actually go through some of the other stuff within those comics that's not Mutant Massacre related because it's still just just so amazing. Uh, after that, we're going to kind of keep continue to break up and segment the story um, as is needed, um, depending on the different tracks that the stories take. I felt um, that you kind of have two parallel lines of stories with Uncanny X-Men and X-Factor in this, and they kind of go, and then there's a couple times where they split off into some of those other non-X-Men titles, and we'll segment the story appropriately as we get there. And then, once we're done with all that, at the end, I'm going to put together my own reading order for this, because because the main reading order that I use just from comicbookreadingorders.com is one of the first things um, you pull up when you Google Mutant Massacre reading order. It's just a rote list of the 12 issues, and I think there needs to be some nuance to that, so I'm going to make like a little flow chart or something like that to kind of show where the characters go and how the story flows between all the different series and issues that are in this, uh, this event series. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the first two issues that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, starting off with Uncanny X-Men issue 210. All right, this issue is written by Chris Claremont with art by Ro John Romita Jr. and Dan Green. Of course, John doing the cover here, looking amazing with that iconic shot there. All right, so now I said that this this book is kind of an intro or an intro or a prelude to what's going on in Mutant Massacre, and it actually kind of bookends this particular issue. So we're going to take a look at a couple pages here in the front, then we'll skip to the back, take a look at two pages there, and then we'll start flipping through the middle because there's definitely some stuff in this book that I want to call out because it is absolutely amazing. All right, so we start here with um, Richard and Tommy. Tommy being one of the uh, the Morlocks here and her boyfriend, Richard, a um, ex-Hellfire uh, Club uh, soldier that you can see uh, his costume going on. And he takes a harpoon to the back from the character Harpoon, one of the Marauders who we have not actually uh, met yet. And it, uh, it is of note that we are in Los Angeles, California. I guess she uh, ran away from home, so to speak, in a previous story arc. So um, right here, um, she uh, Richard is basically telling her, hey, look, we can get through this together if, uh, if we stay together. But if we um, split up, then I'm 100% dead. And she panics and runs, um, says here, I'm so far from home. Uh, I don't know. 
I didn't know this uh, city. No tunnels like like under Manhattan. Nowhere to hide. I thought it'd be such a great adventure, wandering across the whole country. Who's after me? What do they want? Why do they want to kill me? I don't want to die. And then we go back here with Richard as he's about to be uh, to be put down. He tries to beg for his life here, telling the Marauders that um, the Hellfire Club will pay, and they say they're welcome to try. They'll get the same as you. And then we hear the telling gunshot as Tommy um, gets to train she says uh, i'm so tired don't know what to do where to turn that train it's leaving uh, if i can get aboard this freight car without being spotted i can uh the door is shut and locked but her power is to uh, make herself real thin and flat so she slips into and she says uh, but for a mutant a morlock that's no problem uh the narration bubbles here say uh, incredibly tommy folds herself flat as a sheet of paper and slips through the door uh the narration or her thought bubbles here say um <clears throat> say i did it i've made it i'm gonna live everything's gonna be fine everything's going to be all right no it's not and then she uh makes her way um on the train back to the other side of the nation while our marauders here are saying um uh, she's in the fifth car should we take her now and someone says later according to the boss's plan uh, says don't fret marauders uh before we'll through we'll have all we'll all have our share of uh kills and then some i hope malice is having as much fun with her assignment and malice is a character that we'll meet here um doing something with a dazzler here in a minute um but this is where I want to go ahead and jump to the back of the comic, um, because this is all that um, all that has anything to do um, with the uh, with the mutant massacre. Is just like I said, kind of bookending uh, this particular issue. Um, so here we got uh, Tommy making her way and getting back to Manhattan. Uh, the narration over here says, um, The railway tunnel beneath Park Avenue running from the top of Manhattan, Al uh, Manhattan Island down the side to Grand Central Station. Says the 20th century uh, form uh, from Chicago was two hours late as usual, but Tommy couldn't care less as she folds herself flat and slips out of the, the baggage car. And all that matters is, she, is that she's alive and home, but not. Not really. She makes her way into the tunnels and she's caught by the marauders and they say here, uh, you figure us for chumps, girl. Uh, we sh uh, should have listened to your Hellfire Club boyfriend. He had it pegged uh, together. You stood a chance alone. Too bad. We let you go so you'd lead us to your fellow Morlocks. No hard feelings and nothing personal. It's our job. We're pros. The best marauders. Uh, you Don't feel sad, youngster, because where you're going soon you'll have lots of company. And then we hear the gunshot ring out through the tunnels and that is it for mutant massacre specific content for this particular issue so again just kind of an interesting intro showing us that the marauders are out there hunting mutant mutants and now that they and now they have found the official morlock tunnels all right, with the Mutant Massacre stuff out of the way, let's go um, go ahead and go back through some of this. I'm going to skip a little bit of it um, just because it doesn't really play uh, too much into into what's going on. What I was talking about here um, with Dazzler, that is Dazzler um, right here. She's kind of uh, undercover running around with this other band. Um, got the dark hair versus the blonde. Um, we see her a little bit, and that's when this character Malice, like, goes into her and like essentially possesses her we catch up with her um with malice and dazzler one more time in issue 213 of uncanny x-men in this run but we don't see a resolution to that plot point until the following issue in 214 after mutant massacre is done so we're going to kind of skip that um skip that a little bit Alright, so the rest of this issue, I was actually really struck by what was going on. Part of it's dealing with kind of follow-up from what happened in the previous story arc, but there's also a lot of stuff in here about civil rights and, you know, uh, bigotry and everything like that, and the hatred that mutants face just literally walking down the street or being in a restaurant, kind of the core of what X-Men was always meant to be, and that's on full, full display here. So that's kind of what I want to get into here a little bit. So so we've just got Rogue flying through the city, her costume still kind of tattered from that previous story arc, uh, and as she's flying around, this scaffolding breaks, and she ends up uh, catching the dude, or the two the two workers as they're falling, um, and tossing them um, into the lake here. No, she catches the scaffolding, tosses it into the lake, and then uh, catches them, and these guys are basically uh, assuming that they're, di they're dead, until one of them says, Oh, Sanctimicia, Holy Virgin, Joey, we've been saved, and so then she... Uh, 
she drops them off on the street corner and a lot of them are like oh what's going on you know just general uh crowd noises being like oh my god what what, what just happened what did we see um and then uh she says no you no thanks for help no no need for thanks i was glad to help all in a day's work for the x-men and then the dude says oh i could kiss you and then she says maybe next time uh under uh, more pleasant circumstances uh take care uh and you go, of course she can't kiss anybody i got my rogue shirt on it says uh can't touch this got a little mc hammer rogue uh action going on she flies by a window and notices um that she looks absolutely dreadful you can see uh the dirt on her face here and of course the uh the messed up costume uh so she goes to a nearby mall which when i was first reading this i thought it was um kind of weird that it was uh, happening there's like we're watching rogue go on a shopping trip but it does lead to uh her being called out as a mutant and an angry mob uh forming around her it says here she's getting her uh her makeup done and this dude uh from the crowd says ah oh, mutie you don't belong here in a decent store among a decent human people and then uh the woman helping her says well what are you talking about rogue says mutie short for mutant he means me uh may i see that other lips shade of lipstick please so she, rogue is completely unfazed by it and then the dude keeps pressing and says you can't ignore me mutant and uh she says want to bet and he says i'm calling x factor now something that we um that i skipped over here a minute ago rogue saw a uh, a billboard a billboard for x factor at this time in the early days of this new, of this original x factor series the uh, original five mutants that that formed the x-men formed a team called x factor that pretended to be humans that were going around hunting mutants and then did um other stuff as the team called the exterminators where they were protecting mutants and you just you kind of you know being real shady like that. It's like we're going to hunt mutants and hunt mutants and then actually go help them. So he's threatening here to call X Factor and she says, "What who are they?" Um, and he says, "You'll find out the hard way when they take care of you and you're rotten kind for good." And then the dude that Rogue uh, saved from falling off the scaffolding shows up and says, "You talk nice to the lady there, Bob, or you'll answer to me." Basically trying to uh, trying to de-escalate the situation, but um, doesn't quite go that way and Rogue takes her stuff and and flies uh out of flies out of the way and we see an x factor uh billboard um right here all right, back at the X Mansion, we get a great little scene here with Ileana and Peter Rasputin, little brother sister, uh, good times as they're reminiscing. And then we also have a Shadow Cat down here um, uh, fixing some of the equipment. I believe it is uh, Cerebro there in in the mansion, uh, phasing through it and having to be super super extra careful so she doesn't break anything. Because of course, when she phases through uh, technology, she ends up breaking it and can't break Cerebro. That is a very important piece. Now here we're coming up to one of my favorite scenes in this, in this book. We've got Magneto, who is currently the headmaster of uh, the Xavier Mansion. I don't really know where Xavier is uh, right now, but he is serving as uh, head. Or Magneto is serving as headmaster, and he runs off to a meeting at the Hellfire Club. And as he's going there, he uh, comes across this scene where he he runs across. X Factor, who we were talking about earlier, and they see him go into the Hellfire Club. Now that's going to be um, one of my favorite things about this whole run is how it very tightly this whole crossover works. You can track the progression of characters from issue to issue across title very, very cleanly. There's actually a corresponding scene to this one over in X Factor Nine, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Where um, here we get um, a Magneto commenting on seeing X Factor in the other issue we see X-Factor commenting on seeing um, Magneto and trying to hide themselves because they don't want to be outed um, as the X-Men. Really, really cool stuff, and I love how tightly this is all um, put together. So uh, Magneto goes into the Hellfire Club and they say uh, the Hellfire Club is composed of the richest, most powerful men and women in the world. Uh, but within the club is a secret elite inner circle, a cabal, if you will, whose ambition it is to rule the world. Uh, we we lords 
we lowered cardinal rule the circle and then this has got I actually I think I posted this particular page on on my uh, social medias when I was first reading this and it's just absolutely amazing Sebastian Shaw is offering Magneto a place within the Hellfire Club inner circle so up here in the top Sebastian is saying uh, our first our fourth chair the White King is empty we invite you Magneto to claim it for yourself alone or if you will in the name of your precious X-Men so they're literally offering the X-Men a seat at the table of the Hellfire inner circle damn that is really cool um, Magneto says here you must be joking was it only last night Shaw that your consort the Black Queen uh, attempted to slay the X-Men and Emma Frost the White Queen has often uh, tried to suborn my novice students the New Mutants uh, Celine here says, uh, Shaw and I uh, uh, acted in self-defense. Um, Magneto, your renegade X-Men Phoenix tried to murder me. And he says, no doubt, Celine, with good reason. And this speech here from Shaw is is something that I, I absolutely love. He says, patience, everyone. You are quite correct, Magneto. As, as the Black Queen, we have, uh, as is the Black Queen, we have been adversaries and were so last night. But when faced with a common foe, we set aside those fundamental differences and worked together for our mutual survival this morning is much the same look outside at that crowd the accursed x factor something deadly is in the wind and we mutants can no longer afford any form of inter interscene warfare our very nature where uh, we are brand or sorry by our very nature we are branded outcasts from humanity the x-men more so your courage your heroics go unsung you must uh, hide from the very people you defend the lord's cardinal offers sanctuary and the full protection of our considerable powers refuse uh, and for our own survival we will not lift a finger to aid yours you consider us villains we consider you fools those days those labels must be cast aside ours is an alliance of necessity for our uh, for only in unity is their true strength alone we can be eliminated one by one by X Factor the government's freedom force that robot Nimrod uh, we may uh, all together we may hang together Magneto but I guarantee we haven't a prayer in enduring separately and Magneto says a most tempting offer Shaw I and the X-Men shall consider it in Damn, I love this page, and it it ties in so heavily to to what's going on right now in in Dawn of X with Jonathan Hickman's um, era that's going on, um, where he's he has done exactly what Shaw is proposing right here. He has united a mutant kind and given them their own nation state to uh, to to give themselves strength uh, together. So you know he says here, um, you know alone we might be um, eliminated, but together we can survive, and that is exactly what we have done some 34 years later in in x-men and i love it it just it's just as prescient um here uh back then as it is today and i i absolutely love it all right so this next scene is just as good so we're at this warehouse um in a bar and this is where um kitty Peter and Ileana go to find Nightcrawler, who's kind of run off to a bar um, after the events of last issue, and they find him, find him, and he's being attacked by the patrons of the bar attacking him for basically being a mute. And then, um, so they they teleport in using uh, Magic's powers, and they say, um, "What's going on?" And then Peter says, "Here, um, it sounds like there's um, a real ruckus downstairs. Good thing we changed out of our uniforms uh, and left Lockheed at home." So they're basically trying to pass as human. They see what's going on, and Peter says here, uh, "What hope has humanity if we all we do is flee from mobs? It is time. Uh, it, it is time, I think, to find a, a better way uh, by standing up to one." So Peter, in human form, jumps down to try and call off the angry mob. He says, "What are you people doing? Why are you chasing this man? Is he a criminal?" And then the leader here says, uh, "He ain't no man. Uh, ain't even human. He's worse than any crook. He's a mutie." That derogatory term that they have uh, for mutants. Peter says, and is that any cause to hunt him like some animal, to beat him to death? The leader says, a pair of radioactive muties attacked the X-Factor building not far from here. They tore up the street. They could have uh, ha they could have contained the whole, uh, contaminated the whole city, maybe killed millions uh, if X-Factor hadn't driven them off. And there's a note here that that's over in X-Factor um, issue 7. Peter says here, is, is this one of them? Is that why you're attacking him? 
If he has broken the law, then let the proper authorities deal with him. And they say, human law is for human beings. Now back off, fella, or you'll start and you'll get the same. And then that's when Kitty steps in. She says, Peter must be crazy for pulling a stunt like this, and I must be even crazier for going along. She says, hey, mister, what defines a human? And he says, it's obvious, girl. Open your eyes. And she says, that's simple, huh? Well, a whole chunk of my family was murdered in gas chambers because the Nazis said it was obvious that Jews weren't human. And not so long ago, in this country, people felt the same about blacks. Some still do. Is that right? And then the, the guy here says, he scared my kids. And she says, you scare me. Does that g give me any right to beat your brains out? You want to prove how big and tough you are? Well, then beat up on me. Come on. What are you waiting for? You're bigger than me, and I'm just a girl. Hey, maybe I'm a mutie, too. You ever think? of that maybe we all are uh, maybe the big guy can turn to steel and his kid sister's a demon sorceress and I can walk through walls maybe when you're done you can hang our heads on your wall as trophies or better yet take our scalps like they did in the wild west that'll really be something to, pr be, to, to be proud of then the lady here says you shouldn't talk like that to your elders young lady and she says I don't to those I respect. And essentially, Kitty talks the entire crowd down and shames them into walking away, which is just absolutely incredible. It's so phenomenal to go back and, and read these, which uh, are probably much more prescient at the time, but are still, unfortunately, are, are still poignant um, even today. So I think that's about where we're going to wrap up. I think this this last page here, and then we go over to what we've already covered. Um, just a good scene here with um, Storm as, as the leader of the team talking with um, with Wolverine here. So we'll leave it there, and let's jump, go ahead and jump over to X-Factor issue number nine. Alright, moving on here to the next issue. So this one will take a little bit more traditionally. Uh, go through it um, page by page from, from the front to the back. We might skip over some of the initial stuff in here and get closer to the end of the second half of the book uh, because there's some fighting that leads the uh, the X-Factor team. Freedom Force that you see here on the cover as well as Rusty and Skids leads them all down into the Morlock Tunnels which leads us to foreshadowing and more of that uh, kind of prelude to the, the, the more uh, mutant massacre story which we'll get into in uh, the subsequent issues so uh, we open it up here and just uh, to note this one is written by Louise Simonson with art by Terry Shoemaker uh, so here we are in Central Park we've got Freedom Force which consists of uh, kind of your traditional members of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants with Mystique, Avalanche, Pyro and Blob with Spider-Woman and then I think this character's name is actually you know what? I don't know this character's name. I'm sorry. I tried to look it up real quick. I thought it was Uncle Sam. That's a uh, a uh, <laughs> United States Army character and um, a DC Comics character. So someone let me know who what what that character's name is uh, down in in the comments. Uh, so they are chasing Rusty and Skids because as Rusty himself says over here, he says I was in the Navy when my mutant power cut on. I accidentally burned a woman. Um, and then uh, I ran. I freaked out and ran. So he inadvertently hurt someone and then went AWOL. So yes, it makes sense that a government-sanctioned uh, team like Freedom Force would be sent after him uh, to to bring him in. Even if it is really weird that there is a team that consists of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants that works for the government. But you know that's the government for you. Uh, juxtaposed to that, we have um, X Factor, who is uh, pretending to be humans that are mutant hunters, and then by night. They are, of course, the exterminators. Um, they go out in different costumes, which are kind of the, the traditional uh, traditional um, X Factor costumes that you see here with the the X on them. Uh, we you know Jean Grey and and everything up here, but it's the original um, five X Men, and so they are also after Rusty and Skids in an attempt to save them because that's what X Factor does. They pretend to be humans, hunting mutants, and then basically sh uh, shepherd and safeguard those mutants, almost like an underground railroad type situation. Um, for mutants, and it really wants me, uh, makes me want to go back and read. Um, just jump back to issue one of X Factor because this is only issue nine, um, and read this series uh, from the get, at least up through uh, when it changes teams later on, and even maybe through that. I love X Men. I want to read it all one of these days, right? 
Uh, so they are rushing to Central Park to try and save um, Rusty and Skids, and on their on their way, they run into uh, some cops right here. And the cop says, um, "I saw you on TV fighting uh, them radioactive mutants. Saved the city. You did. Your organization top is tops in my books. Uh, makes me proud to be a human." I'm um, actually calling out right here that he was that they were fighting radioactive mutants. That's something that the angry mob said um, just a few pages ago in uh, the end of uh, Uncanny X Men uh, two. So we're getting those, you know, kind of crossovers there between the two, you know, being them being very tightly uh, woven together um, for one of the first, I think, uh, X-Men uh, crossovers here. Really, really good to see that. That was one of the things I wanted to look for when going through this is to see how tight of a crossover and event it is. It seems like today, by modern standards, um, it's a little loosey-goosey, like there's an event going on and there's a tie-in issue here and there, but it doesn't always work. This one is really, really tight. Uh, tightly woven. All right. So the um, the the cop just continues on here, and uh, Cyclops here says, um, "Listen, Officer uh, X Factor appreciates the city's vote of confidence, but why didn't y'all just call the Avengers? They're like right up the street." And he says, "Well, I don't. Uh, we don't exactly trust them. See, uh, between you and me, we'd rather count on our own kind." And then Jean kind of flips out. She's like, "Your own kind? But the Avengers aren't mutants. They're as human as you are." And he says, uh, "Says you, little lady, I can't tell the difference. Just uh, emphasizing the." the bigotry and innocence of the average person towards uh, mutants and even uh, superheroes at large um, in in the uh, in this world at this time. And so here we go. We have another moment here that um, just shows how tightly woven this crossover is. Um, in issue 210 of uh, Uncanny X-Men, we see Magneto go to the, uh, the Hellfire Club and X-Factor sees him. And this is where we're seeing the other side of that. Previously, we got Magneto's uh, n internal monologue there. And now we're seeing how X Factor receive, uh, see, uh, responds to seeing Magneto go in there, and I this is really interesting. Um, uh, Jean here says, "Let me go, Warren. Uh, don't you see that it's Magneto?" She says, uh, "Scott, the man's a villain, a criminal, uh, but he just walked by a squad of cops and they didn't even blink. That's insane." And Scott says, "Of course it's insane. How else could you ex uh, how can you expect anything else in a world where the former Brotherhood of Evil Mutants calls itself Freedom Force and works for the government? So basically everything." is is just topsy-turvy and then they bemoan the fact that Magneto is uh, currently the head of uh, of the Xavier Institute. Uh, so from there they uh, go into actually one note thing. Doesn't anybody question the fact that Warren is wearing this backpack like all the time? Like that thing is huge. Obviously, obviously it's there to um uh, 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 to, to hide his wings or conceal his wings. But does no one ever question that? Like like they're doing an interview with the news or something. It's like, hey, I see you're always wearing that backpack. What do you have in that backpack? And he's just like, uh, stuff and things. Definitely not mutant wings. That's definitely not in there. I just, I thought it was funny uh, going back and reading this uh, for the first time. Uh, so, uh, X, uh, so Freedom Force is uh, attacking uh, Rusty and Skids as, and then they themselves get attacked by the mob who hates mutants. And they're, you know, yelling here. Uh, they were here. Um, they're saying, uh, "We can't let these mutants get away with it. Stop them now, or they'll be running you nor New York." Uh, because the crowd sees uh, Freedom Force as mutants, but see Rusty and Skids as humans because they have that outward appearance. They don't have any. Uh, they're not in costumes. They don't have, you know. Formities like the blob or anything, uh, anything uh, like that going on. And so they're basically having to to deal with the mob, and then X Force um, shows up, and they're like, "Oh wow, what, what's going on here? We can't uh, can't let uh, that happen." They stop the mob, and Beast even here says, "If we don't put a stop to this now, uh, someone will get hurt. Uh, probably one of you." And this little punk says, "Hey, it's X Factor. What gives? Uh, jealous? We're doing uh, uh, your your guy's job for you." And that just goes to show how probably how awful it is for, or how hard it is for X-Force or X-Factor um, to pretend to be humans hunting mutants to, to pretend to be their own worst enemy. It's probably got to, you know, be super hard on them. Uh, so the, the, the mob just kind of uh, distracts everything, and from there, Rusty and Skids get away, and they run down into the tunnels, and that's where we're starting to get closer and closer to uh, mutant massacre territory. Uh, I do love this moment right here from 
from Destiny. It's part of that um, uh, foreshadowing that's going on. Uh, Destiny says, uh, Rusty has entered the tunnels beneath Manhattan, but I'm unable to predict the outcome. Uh, should we follow all I see there? is death indeed that's uh that's going to be everything that's uh coming up in the next uh couple issues all right so uh back at x factor headquarters we have the character Artie, who i've always kind of had a soft spot for he's super cute and then he hooks up with leech here in a minute which is even more uh super cute i think uh i would really dig it if marvel legends would do like a two-pack of these two characters together i'd even take like a funko pop uh two-pack funko pop of these two uh characters together be super cute i know they're like really way far down on the rung of uh, important X-Men uh, related characters, but I would buy that merchandise, and I'm sure a number of, of you guys would as well. So Artie's power is that he can kind of see things that are coming and kind of project um, uh, kind of mental projections, and he can see uh, what's going on, but he can't talk. So he sees everything that's coming. He sees Rusty and Skids, then he sees Freedom Force following them and then sees the, starts to see the marauders uh, attacking the Morlocks and everyone else down in there so uh, he tries to warn uh, the people there at the um uh, the, the public director, um, the Cameron Hodge, the, the public relations director for X-Force, but she kind of shoos him out of the office, uh, not paying attention to the kid. Um, and so what does he do? He draws a picture on the wall with marker, uh, no less, to kind of leave a note for, for where he's going and then uh, goes down into the tunnels himself. Uh, as X-Force, or X-Factor, I'm sorry, uh, come back, they realize that they were hoping that Rusty and Skid would have come back to... Uh, uh, to X Factor headquarters, and that's when they notice this, and they say, "Oh, okay, now we know what's going on. Let's go into the tunnels ourselves." Uh, this is where we catch up with Artie in the tunnels, and that's where he meets Leech. I love, I love that little panel. Also, where X Factor takes off their um, X X Factor costumes and puts on their Exterminator costumes, which are infinitely cool. I really dig uh, this costume set right here. Um, and so they say, uh, it's the exterminators to the rescue. Again, I'm just going to keep calling them X-Factor because it's just easier. Uh, here we go. Leech and Artie. Look at them in their matching beanies. Oh, they're so cute. I love the little boop on the nose uh, right there. Um, they're just kind of feeling each other out. And then Leech takes um, Artie back to Caliban. Great character there. We saw him, of course, live action in the, the Logan movie. Amazing movie. Caliban's kind of one of those characters you never really expect to see in, in a live action movie. But hey, there you go. We saw him. So as these three are getting to know each other, they hear a screech and they're like, wait, what was that? Now, I don't know if that screech screech was the um was tommy being killed like we saw at the end of uncanny 210 or if it was rusty and skids coming across the body of tommy which we see right here so we can start to see these uh or continue to see these two uh issues continue to uh interconnect here so they run across that body and they that's when uh, freedom force uh catches up with them and then we end up having a big old fight uh down here under the under the sewers at the x factor show Shows up so it's X Factor versus Freedom Force with Rusty and Skids uh, right there um, in the middle. Uh, really cool action scenes uh, going on here. I mean, look at all that. Uh, and then we got Destiny here once again saying, I can see nothing here but death. Mystique says, Destiny, stay here out of the way uh, with you. With uh, out your precognition, you're truly blind. Um, but she can still see, she can still see uh, that death. Um, and so uh, more and more fighting, just some, some good uh, action stuff between uh, these two characters. And then again, once again down here, she said, uh, uh, Destiny says, Mystique, we got to go. We got to leave now. Uh, you made a deal to preserve our lives. Why are you throwing them away now? If we stay here, you and I and most of the others will die. Uh, as sure as Rusty Collins is as good as dead already. And Mystique's like, are you sure? And she says, I have never been more certain. We we gotta go. Bad, bad stuff is is coming, and so they uh, Freedom Force kind of uh, takes starts taking off there. The uh, the uh, I almost said the X Men X Factor um, help out Rusty and Skids. And then here on the next page, they hear more screaming, and we see uh, Leech, Caliban, and uh, Artie down here cowering in fear with more screaming. And so that foreshadowing, that little bit of prelude, and all of that there. 
Uh, last page here is really just um, Mystique planning on doxing, uh, essentially Warren Worthington, uh, outing him, outing X Factor, and and all of that. We'll see the fallout of that in in some some uh, uh, f uh, future issues or some subsequent issues. I did want to point this out because this is really, really cool. Um, kind of an old school uh, flowchart for uh, the the way this works. So we've got uh, X Men two ten X Factor uh, nine kind of intersecting uh, right here. We see Magneto there uh, going back and forth between, and then X Men two eleven and ten here, and they're kind of going back between, and then it gets a little squ little swirly um, down here in the bottom. And we'll talk about all of that as we get to uh, the future issues in this one. All right, guys. So that's the first two issues of Mutant Massacre, Uncanny X Men two ten and X Factor nine. So basically just setting up just prelude a little bit of foreshadowing uh getting us into uh the meat of mutant massacre which will start up in our next video probably coming out next tuesday i'll probably try and do these at least once a week uh usually on tuesdays because you know we've got uh the what's on your pull list on mondays and then new comics from the week start on wednesday so tuesday's kind of a dead day that might become the rewind review day here uh here on the channel so guys what do you think of the first two issues of mutant massacre let me know your thoughts and opinions down in the comments down below thank you guys so much for watching if it's your first time here at the channel please go ahead and hit that subscribe button for me it would definitely mean a lot uh, down in the description box down below i have a link to my patreon page as well as an ask me anything tip page if you would like to support the channel that way i also have a link to my or uh, my, my p.o box listed as well as my email address and all of my social medias if you want to reach out to me one of those ways once again guys thank you so much for watching and until next time We'll see you at the comic shop.